All right, welcome everybody to another edition of Ham Radio Perspectives. And this time we're going to look at something very unusual. We're going to go back to 1920, a wild time when Alexander Graham Bell and Lee DeForest judged the first big public ham radio contest. As far as we know, this has not been reported anywhere else. And we're going to give you the skinny on it. Who are we? We're Ham Radio Perspectives. We look at the history, culture, and technology behind ham radio. I'm Quinn, the K8QS. And I'm Tom, WA9TDD. And uh, Quentin, what did you, uh, what kind of marvelous things have you dug up in the archives today? Well, <laughs> yeah, right. What have I dug up? Look at this. This is a contest from 1920. I'm an academic by training, you know, and I do research. And uh, Tom, I gotten into this. This is an amazing story. And uh, we don't know why the story ends the way it does. So we want to invite you guys up front or you women to post your comments because we need your help in figuring <laughs> out the thesis behind why this contest went the way it did. But it's really quite amazing. So this was the first big public U.S. ham contest. I found it by looking at 20, the 21,600 newspapers that are in the newspapers.com archive looking back for ham radio and contests it was promoted by the washington herald the dc paper uh important paper at the time by the newspaper enterprise association which is a syndicator of news so they were going to send these news reports of this national contest all over the country to other papers by the navy that gets involved as you see uh, almost at the very top of the navy and by the marconi company and it was judged by Alexander Graham Bell, Lee DeForest, a Marconi engineer, and others. And as we say, as this contest goes out, a 10-day contest, it leads to a very interesting, quote-unquote, conclusion that we need your help, your input in interpreting. So, Tom, that's what I came up with, buddy. Good job. Now, this is important because during World War I, the government suspended any rare Radio am and an amateur at that time was anybody who had either a receiver or a receiver and transmitter. Suspended radio communications due to the uh, due to World War One. They didn't want anybody spying on anybody or sending. Oh yeah, unusual messages. So <laughs> <laughs> I was just spying on you. That's all. What What was that? Oh, spying on me. Okay. <laughs> So, as it, as it happened, after World War I ended, the Navy Department determined that they alone should be the sole benefactor of any radio. In the meantime, a war began between the Navy and amateur radio was supported by the ARRL and several senators who, in November of 1919, had the Navy's stranglehold on radio communications ended and thus began radio again, as we know it as amateurs. So radio is just beginning to open up. There's some concern about it, uh, but uh, the government's looking at it, thinking about regulating it. And then this contest takes off in spring of 1920. And uh, in 1920, the players involved that were all involved related to this contest included Marconi. And Marconi was selling a gear, of course, radio gear, but it was pricey. The Navy, Navy was involved. They needed operators because all the ships needed operators. They also wanted inexpensive equipment and, and innovation. Uh, they weren't too keen necessarily on paying what Marconi wanted. The U.S. government's involved because it's seeking to regulate all this stuff, and it's getting some pressure from the soon-to-be-developing uh, broadcasters that wonder if all of these amateurs should be out there causing interference. Uh, and then you've got the electronics retailers, the stores, and the electronics schools out there, and they want to attract younger males primarily uh, to, to make their equipment, buy, buy their equipment at the local stores, and also to sign up for these schools, some of which exi uh, existed all the way into the 1960s. And then, of course, you got the, the amateur operators pursuing fun amidst all of this chaos. Now, Tom, what exactly was an amateur operator in 1920? An amateur radio operator in the, the 1920s was as anybody who had a receiver 
who was playing around with radio electronics, was uh, transmitting, had a spark gap transmitter. Anybody who was playing with the radio airwaves was considered an amateur. You didn't need particular legal license. Uh, it was a free oh, for all. Oh, you definitely didn't need a license. Oh. And in fact, you didn't even have to have a transmitter, right? That's right. All you need to as a receiver was to be considered an amateur or an, an amateur. experimenter or uh, what do they call it? A radioite. A radioite. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So here's that's the context, gang, for this incredible contest that takes place in 1920. And the first announcement of it comes in the Washington, D.C. paper called The Herald. And the headline you can read here, $1,000 in prizes offered to amateur radio operators in Herald Contest. Now, this was not just a Herald Contest. This was launching a national contest. The equivalent of that $1,000 today would be $13,500. So this was no uh, small thing for all these amateurs out there. The contest was a, uh, a three 10-day, quote-unquote, events, all right? And uh, the events were, first of all, an essay. You could enter one or more of these. Essay on the practical knowledge of radio work. A photo of a station along with a 300-word description of your outfit. That's what they called them back then, your outfit. Or third, the best long-distance receiving record. Not, to, not a two-way record like we think about today. You know, when we think about ham contests today, we're thinking about hams connecting with other hams and being able to document that as a two-way QSO. This is different. Receiving. Made by an operator with an amateur station. So there had to be an amateur station on one end. The Navy signals for reception were particularly important here, as we'll talk about, because the Navy had probably the most powerful transmitter there, there was. So you could actually enter this contest by listening to the Navy and picking them up as well. And here we have the three national judges that'll pick the winners on the radio contest. Uh, number one is Lee DeForest, inventor of the wireless apparatus. He has a practical knowledge of radio work and his chief engineer, Robert Gowan, apparently did much of the entry reviewing. Yeah, Lee DeForest, wow. Uh, big time. And these were announced right away at the beginning of the contest as the national judges. J.S. Newman, an author of junior scientific works. I couldn't find anything particular to a publication called junior scientific Works, So he must have been a junior author. Would you assume that? Yeah, junior author on uh, academic uh, work, academic papers. Uh, actually, I think he was on the Seinfeld show, too, but we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> El Elmer E. Bucher, the instructing engineer of the Marconi Company. I'm supposed this is the guy they sent out to uh, teach operators how to operate their particular Marconi apparatus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good engineering because they were expensive at that time, too. Okay, now who are the sponsors and supporters behind this thing? The local newspapers, like the Washington Herald. That was the lead one. But connected with them was the National, with the Newspaper Enterprise Association, which is a syndicator. They would send out news, sports, comics to 220 papers nationally. And they would do it for money. They were interested in making money by sending out this contest information, having other papers pick it up. Uh, and the papers were interested in this because then they might generate some advertising from local electronic stores and the like. You had the electronic businesses, the retailers, ads. We'll show you one in a second. You had the radio schools. We'll show you a little bit about that as well. And, of course, the military, especially the Navy, which needed radio operators and inventors, or so they said, on many occasions. This is, again, right after the post-World War I radio shutdown. And here we have the famous QST, some kind of apparatus there, uh, from the... Uh, Radio Apparatus Service, and the uh, 13th Street in Washington, D.C. They're buying ad space in the newspaper, probably fact, a quarter, a quarter fact, page this ad, ad. This ad was uh, the same page as the announcement of the contest in the Washington, D.C. Herald. So you can see right away this collaboration between the local stores uh, who knew that people would be interested in this contest might likely also be interested in going to the store and, and buying some. Uh, equipment and of course the you had the the uh, schools out there too that were teaching a radio like the national radio institute which is a correspondence school 
Uh, in fact, it won't surprise us if some of you actually took some of their courses because they were in operation until 68. And the National Radio School, which was classroom based in D.C. And again, you can see the ad that they were running at the same time that this contest was being announced. And you can be a radio expert in a field that's almost romance. Wow. Wow. Almost romance. There you go. So there are a lot of people involved in promoting this. Okay. Day one promo. Flash. Yes. Transmit. <laughs> Transmit CW to 3EK on Herald Building Roof. This is apparently reaching out to those that did have a transmitter uh, to contact 3EK and to request uh, materials to apply to participate. Yeah, very interesting. So the newspaper gets some amateurs to put an antenna and a rig in the Washington Herald newspaper building. And they say flash, which means send uh, to 3EK for information. And then they would have people, these amateurs at the newspaper office in the evening, listening for people who would send in and ask for information. And then they would send them contest information. And not only that, but immediately, right away, the Navy gets involved. The Navy's re -admir uh, rear admiral, Bullard, quote unquote, broadcast. What's going on with this, Tom? Well, I don't know, but he's uh, flashing news all over the place of the Herald's radio contest. And apparently it was transmitted at 15 words a minute. Much sounds much like the ARRL code practice. Yeah, so uh, every night the Navy was putting news out and, and weather forecasts and stuff uh, for amateurs around the country. to, to Anybody wanted to, to, to pick it up and follow the CW. And so added to the Navy's CW nightly bulletins uh, was information about the contest and this is stunning when you look at this wow this is the this is the arlington naval station they run on 100 kilowatts of power on 113 kilohertz the transmitter uh is, the amplifiers are shown in the uh, inset on the left on the right you could see the three towers that they had they were called the three sisters and they weren't demolished until sometime in the 1960s Two of the towers were at 400 feet. The central tower was at 600 feet. So we're talking about a lot of power and a lot of uh, motivation here to get their signal out. Yeah, so you get it, gang. This information about the contest is going out in the newspapers to through the syndicator. It's going out through the Navy station, this big Arlington station. And so it's got to be generating some enthusiasm and some interest right out of the chute as this gets going. Now, over the 10 days of the contest with those three events, uh, there was a lot of promotion going on. Uh, daily syndicated paper news stories across the U.S. giving the rules of the contest. There's not much here work, uh, worth uh, repeating to you other than things like the manuscripts or photographs that you submit cannot be returned to you. The same sorts of things you'd have in contests today, but it's going out. Uh, entry form. For the third event in the Washington Herald's contest, remember the third event is that receiving event where you're going to prove, quote unquote, we'll show you how they were trying to prove this, how far away you were able to pick up another station. On the bottom of this uh, application, look at this, is a notary, Tom. you got to get this thing notarized saying what station you heard at what distance and what frequency that this is this goes beyond what's required typically with hands you know sending a qsl card we don't have to go to notaries right all right they obviously wanted to make sure you were legitimate and not a robot yeah with the the dough involved the the money right uh, understandable <laughs> and events and prizes the washington herald's radio contest yeah, uh, and, 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 left and left column, the, the rules, and then on the right column, the first event, prizes, prizes for the best 500-word essay on amateur rail wireless telegraphy. Nothing here about actually operating, but an essay on the uh, um, best practices. First prize of $200, second prize $100, third prize $50, and finally 30 pairs of redhead radio receivers as additional prizes. Retail value of each money. seven dollars. All right. And here's the the redheads. These are the beats headphones of the era, the the earbuds of the day. Uh six dollars and fifty cents, a triumph in a radio receiver design. 
<laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I owned something like that uh, in the 60s when I was licensed, Tom. Man, those things did not sit well on my head after a half hour. You got a head. Yeah, you usually ended up with a, not only a headache, but with a red band across your head. <laughs> so at any rate, all these prizes being announced. And that was big money. Remember, gang, that was big money in those days. And this went out to the newspapers. The Lexington, Kentucky paper says amateur wireless operators here offered big prize by Newspaper Enterprise Association through leader. And we go to Washington, D.C. Scores enter Herald Wireless Contest by Telegraph and Radio. Scores are entering, Tom. Hey, at least 40, right? 220. Uh, right. Replies. Uh, the replies yeah. are pouring in. They're pouring, pouring in, in. Tom. Oh, uh, man, what a big promotion. This has got to attract every wireless experimenter in the country. You bet. And uh, in, in red, we marked down there, following are some of the first messages received. And we didn't put it in here because they're all basically the same saying, send me the information. Uh-huh. How do I sign up? <laughs> Give me the dough, the mula kula. Uh, I want to get into this. And Salt Lake City, Salt Lake wireless enthusiasts rush to enter a $1,000 contest. LDS University. I bet that became Brigham Young, Tom. I'll bet you that is. And the East High groups give endorsement to plan and are preparing their manuscripts and their photographs. Uh, They're going to compete with all of these city slickers on the (laughs) East Coast. Entry stories. DC radio contest attracts boy. Theodore Wilden catches broadcast message and enters list. He Good heard for the you. broadcast. And Good he for you, Ted. Go for it, Ted. Yeah, and, and Ted was so excited about this, and his mother was so excited that uh, look at what happens here. Young Wilden, he went to Washington, D.C., to the nation's capital with his mother, Mrs. Lillian Wilden, and an 11-year-old sister. And they were going to visit, in fact, the Navy building where the messages are sent out from the Arlington Towers. This is exciting, Tom. Very exciting. Oh, really? And, and then a number of days into the contest. Now, this was not at the beginning, but a number of days in, local judges were being appointed. Three local judges announced for D.C. Apparently recruited by Herald in the Newspaper Enterprise Association, a re- veritable rogues gallery of experimental geniuses. Gilbert Grosvenor, editor-in-chief of the National Geographic magazine, author of the historical summary of Peary's polar exploration. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone. Mr. Bell has done considerable in recent years to promote the teaching of speech to the deaf. And Major Mylan V. Ayers, he's a prominent electric railway engineer and the author of numerous technical papers and reports on electricity. I just have to go back here, one on uh, Graham Bell on that photo. He d- he definitely did not have a publicity agent. <laughs> a, a bad job of cropping on his head. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, but think about this, gang. Uh, amazing local judges. And more promotion coming out during the 10-day period. Amateur radioites everywhere flash their entries to the $1,000 contest. You know, radioites, Tom, I think that's from the Old Testament. Weren't they one of the tribes, the Old Testament tribes, the radioites? I, I, weren't they the Lost Tribe? The Lost Tribe, yeah. The they, Lost they, Tribe of the radioites. Yeah, they, they, they had their uh, their yagis, and they were chasing signals. <laughs> they got so lost. They were, they were chasing DX in the desert. Yeah, they. Uh, okay. Oh, look at this! Tell us about it, Tom. I, I can't. I can't hold back on my excitement about this contest. I tell you, it's attracting all the big names on the uh, experimental elect- electricity electronics of the day. Sir Oliver Lodge, the British physicist, writer, radio patent holder, the radio wave detector that named the coherer. And if you're not familiar with the coherer, it was the predecessor to what's commonly known as the diode. Or in the case of um, crystal set, the crystal. All right. I'm going to do an imitation here. You ready? I'm going to put a big, big hold on here. Uh, You tell me how I'm doing. This is a coherer. What do you think? 
No, that's not a coherer. Not good, a coherer. No, a cure. A coherer was a glass uh, vial filled with iron particles with a wire on each end, and when it received a signal, it would close the circuit and uh, ring a bell. Oh, and it also okay. had it also had a little tapper that um, would break up the magnetic particles after the signal was received. Clever, clever invention. It it would ring a, an Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> 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 Bad pun. Yeah, bad Ter pun. Yeah, I mean, keep it's going. Like getting a text message, terrible. Okay, mm -hmm. hey gang, come on. But this is big, Sir Oliver, a Sir. All right, is, is involved here. And here's here's a little uh, quote from a Cleveland paper on this. The uh, this is the amateurs. Is, uh, well, go ahead. Go okay. Well, the amateurs will make the greatest developments in wireless in the near future. And. Encourage them, says Sir Oliver Lodge, distinguished British scientist now lecturing in America. That's hey, right. I got to go back to that. Go back to that coherer. Um, that actually didn't function as a diode. That uh, functioned as a um, receiving device. Right. You know, yeah. It was a more like you know, more like a primitive speaker rather than uh, or headphones rather than a uh, actual detector. So, sorry about that. I thought it had like one coil in another. Maybe I'm no. I'm, uh, uh, look, at we're we're totally screwed up. Don't pay any attention to what we're saying here. We got the contest right. <laughs> that our That's right. Is crappy. Um, all right. So here we go, gang. Uh, and then we get in DC five more new radio prizes from GW Parezo. GW Parezo. George Perezo of 808 9th Street Northwest. He's a radio enthusiast who contributed five special awards for the amateur radio operators of the district. Of course, they don't tell you what those uh, rewards or prizes were, uh, but he has an expensive radio outfit in his store, which he generously places at the disposal of young men and women interested in radio reminds me of the old amateur electric supply store in chicago old doc there letting you play with his equipment yeah or today you go to some of the big uh, chain stores and they have the equipment set up so this guy had some kind of equipment set up and he's offering uh, prizes uh, i think it i think actually he also had an italian no restaurant I, i'm <laughs> just kidding here uh, so Amateur radio operators must act at once to enter the Washington contest. Enter now. Only one day left. And see here how it says QST, Q, da, 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 15 words a minute over the Navy transmitter. Many, many watts beaming out around the world. Come on, everybody. Come on. The Herald's contest to close at midnight tonight. Uh oh, Tom, we are in deep trouble. A young woman amateur operator entered the race for awards. Oh, no. Oh, boy. And this is what the newspaper said. Man alive, you young men who are ardent radio amateurs, are you going to let the young women crowd you out in the winning of a total of 74 awards, aggregating $1,050? Men, your virility, your masculinity is on the line, right? Right. You, you got to make this happen. And then there were these ongoing distance reports. Remember, that third event of the three so this one is one of the reports at 11 o'clock last night, the amateur radio operator to enter the contest from the point farthest from Washington was A.H. Kane, a proprietor of the Kane's Garage in Rude House, Illinois. I wonder if that's a typo, Rude House, Illinois. Well, I don't think it exists anymore. In any case, typo or not, Here's towards the end of the open part of the contest saying, get those reports in. See if you can beat this one, gang. See what you can do. They're ready to pick radio winners, judges to select the best amateurs in the Herald contest today. And Alexander Graham Bell, Tom, was able to serve. It was questionable at the end in the articles because he caught a cold. Right. Oh, but he, he made it. He so fought through judges, it. He saw through it. He suffered through it. Judges meet today. Maybe it was suffering to read those entries. Uh, to pick winners in radio contest, hard task to select select the best. And, and in this article, it says the three judges, these are the, the three judges, Bell and the others, the local ones, sent word to the radio editor of the Washington paper now last night 
that it would be necessary for them to meet again today before they would be prepared to certify the winners. That's how inundated they were in 1920 with this contest and 13,000 buckaroos, Tom. Mm. And we're urged to send pictures. All amateur radio operators who sent essays, photographs, or receiving records to be entered in the Washington Herald's radio contest are requested to send their pictures today or tomorrow to the radio editor of the Washington Herald. They're right, urged so to send pictures. They urged. must have pictures. They have they're, pro they're probably going to have a front page plastered with pictures of all these radio operators. In fact, they're going to send them out all over the country through the Newspaper Enterprise Association and uh, all these pictures and put them in the papers. And, you know, this is going to this is going to help the local newspaper salespeople go out and get ads from the local electronic suppliers and stuff. It's uh, fantastic what's going on here, gang. Uh, and here we go. April 7, one day later, the end of the contest, the long-distance record winner is announced, Howard Grunberg. Uh-oh. Big problem. No data. We don't know who we heard, how far away it was. Presumably, it was farther than Washington, D.C. is from, uh, what was that, Roadhouse, uh, Illinois. <laughs> No data, no picks, so they announce this guy is a winner, but there's no information in the Washington Herald. Now, the big surprise, gang, the great fizzle. Kaboom. Oh, man. No DC articles over the next two days. All, it's all quiet. Then. All, all quiet. Then. Ta-da! The winner for D.C. for best rig station. But where's the picture? No picture. I don't see, I don't see any picture. He gets I don't the see. I don't. One. I don't see any. Uh, I don't see any rig. I don't see any data about how far this guy even was. No. So what they did was to publish this guy's description of his station. We're not going to read this whole thing here, but you can read it at your leisure. It's kind of interesting, you know. He's got. Uh, 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 quite a station going, but there's no picture. Aha! But and this, if, a, if a picture's worth in words, he wrote a thousand words to paint a picture. Yeah, I think this was the uh, 300 word limit on this one. But in any case, uh, no photo. Then another winner announced one day later, Walter Reed, the winner of the fifth special award, uh, the fifth one, uh, only two others were uh, named of the Herald's radio contest. Photograph of station and 200 word description of outfit deemed best by the judges. Uh oh. Zippo. No pick in paper. They did not publish the description. Nothing. They just give this guy's a typical bio picture here they, uh, they got from somewhere and uh, uh, no other information. Uh, now, the rest of the D.C. winners are listed the same day, but no picks and no distance. We don't know how far away any of these people actually listened. A and then in the midst of this, Tom, in this article where they give the winners but don't say much about them, uh, they have this crazy paragraph, uh, this runner up. The examiners felt that it might not be inappropriate. Note this language, Tom, that it might not be inappropriate to make special mention of the contribution of A. May Rogers entitled, quote, the wireless girl, unquote. While this contribution was judged not to comply <laughs> with the conditions as set forth in sufficient measure to justify the awarding of a prize, it is felt to be a commendable piece of literature and worthy of honorable mention. What the heck <laughs> is this? I can't make any sense of this, Tom. I, I, can't, for, I, I can't follow the rules, but I want an honorable mention. Yeah, and I looked in all of the papers in the U.S., the 21,000 or whatever, newspapers.com. There was no other mention of this person or of this wireless girl. And it did not comply with the conditions. I wonder if she sent in a photo, Tom, which was not appropriate or something. I don't know. 
I can't. I just cannot figure this out. But but she's uh, commendable, and it's called a commendable piece of literature. Maybe it was a short story or something. At any rate, we're going to go on. No more DC paper articles until one national winner from DC was announced a month later, and this was. Uh, Margaret Carroll, uh, winner, uh, national winner number two. She was from D.C. too for her 500-word essay on wireless amateur telegraphy. Here's a little quote from it. There's nothing noteworthy about this essay. Radio, the mystic word indeed typifies a deep mystery, blah, blah, blah. And then it says in the last the sentence here, a part of the essay, we have merely scratched the surface in our knowledge of radio. Anybody could have written this. Uh, she gets... The, the second best uh, award there nationally. She's from D.C. Uh, it, you know, it's not bad writing or whatever. Uh, you can read more of it in the paper if you're really excited about it. But virtually no contest coverage of winners in papers across the U.S., Tom. And I looked and looked. And even after all this hype, all this stuff about scores coming in, um, you know, uh, yet the Washington Herald, the newspaper that pushed this in the beginning claimed in the article about Carol's award, the following. Thousands of entries received nationally. DeForest and his chief engineer, Robert Gowan, along with the other two national judges, spent four days reviewing the entries. Gowan was so impressed that he borrowed the entries to write a treatise, a treatise, no less on the success of the amateur in a wireless technical magazine. Amazing. That's what the Washington, D.C. Herald said. And they also said this, in the opinion of the judges and those interested in the future of the wireless, not just amateur wireless, but the wireless, the contest did much to stimulate interest among amateurs and to bring to the general public some knowledge of what, quote, the kid next door, unquote, <laughs> is doing with this greatest miracle of all times speech across space we're talking morris code here speech across space the kid next door tom the kid next door here's the kid next door and if you haven't weren't familiar with this comet Look it up. It's hilarious. So, Mrs. Frooster, as your boy operating his ham radio set again, my TV is on the fritz. Same as before. Same <laughs> kind of interference. It jiggled up and down. A ham radio. I'll bet that's why the fuse blew in my garage. Just hilarious. Yeah. So, uh, here's the other side of it. Uh, and we we're going to do a later video, by the way, on the early newspaper articles about ham interference. So uh, get ready for that, because that's kind of interesting in and of its own right. So here's what the kid next door was doing, causing uh, interference. In part, we're just joking around a little bit. So here we are, Tom. This is the, this is the contest. We're 33 minutes into this doggone video, and we would like to report to you all kinds of outcomes about what this did for the hobby. But instead, we have all this irony and questions, and we would like to ask you to post notes. Tell us what you think happened. No station photos were published. None. Zip. Nada. Number two, only one essay was published. Number three, the Washington Herald, which was the big one pushing this, along with the Newspaper Association, 220 papers nationally, did not keep its own word to publish daily reports of the winners. Number four, we're wondering, we're just wondering, was the Navy the big proponent behind the scenes, hoping to get equipment ideas to outfox Marconi, which was going to charge them an awful lot. We don't know. We don't know. We've got some speculation, and we might post some notes below, too, on what our speculation is. But we would like to get your response. Seriously, uh, we, I've been through all of the newspapers on this. Tom and I have talked it over. We've got some speculation. But, but what do you think? So this is Ham Radio Perspectives, talking about the history, culture, technology of ham radio. My name's Quinn, K8QS. And I'm Tom, WA9TDD. And please subscribe. And also don't forget to post notes here. Help us figure out what happened with the first great big public ham radio contest with judges none other than Lee DeForest and Alexander Graham Bell. 73, everybody. <laughs>